My name is Lori Hartwell, and I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm the president and founder of Renal Support Network, and I have had kidney disease since 1968, since I was two years old, and I have had four transplants and spent 13 years on dialysis. And I know how important knowledge and hope is. It's essential to thriving and surviving. So I'm really proud to uh, present this conference today. Today, we're gonna to be speaking about um, the subject of chronic kidney disease and different uh, um, disease states or questions that we may have that will help us. And it's absolutely my pleasure to introduce Wendy Rogers. Wendy Rogers has been a friend for a very long time. Um, I, I think I met her over 12 years ago, 15 years ago. I don't really remember Wendy, but she's pretty fascinating with her story and her ability to survive and thrive with this illness. And please give a warm round of applause to Wendy Rogers. Wow, Lori, thank you. And you're right. We've been on this journey a long time, and I'm very grateful to you. And welcome, everybody uh, who's here today. I'm so glad that you gathered here. Um, for Hope Week. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about my journey, but with chronic kidney disease. So, you know, we all start off with goals in life and a plan in life. And I am what I like to say, or would like to say, I guess, the ultimate planner. And um, back in the day, going to college and planning out my life, I was extremely so a planner and my life goal was to become, to become an optometrist and work in the field, looking at eyeballs every day. And that was what I dreamed to do. But um, as you can see in my background and my career, I'm not an optometrist. I actually became a science teacher. I have a degree in biology, a master's in education and a master's in public health. And I have found that um, I'm very grateful to have the education, but it didn't have anything to do with optometry, but I still feel that um, what I've strived to do in my life has been very, very useful. I now work at the Lupus Foundation of America as the Director of Care and Support Services, and I'm going to just share a little bit about my experience with uh, CKD or chronic kidney disease. So I'm a 21-year lupus warrior. Um, this is why I am a part of this community. As you know, so many of us have different reasons why we have to care for our kidneys or why we might need um, care for chronic kidney disease. And this one just is mine. I was going along in life. I am a native from Texas and uh, Cher is my native Texas friend that I found in this network. And I moved to California with the hopes of actually becoming a optometrist, but I also got married and came with my um, young daughter who was in about third grade. And I was living the California dream. I was driving around in the sunny weather, having a good time. And I decided to teach because I needed to be a resident of California to apply to the optometry school. Well, within that time frame of waiting and teaching, I noticed some key symptoms, as you can see, and I've just done a short rundown um, here of what's happened to me. I noticed I started having joint pain, I was tired, and this was the type of fatigue where I just never ever felt rested. My hair started falling out, but I also noticed I started gaining weight or swelling, and I thought it was just, I needed to adjust to the environment. Um, I noticed my urine was foamy as well, and um, as you guys know, uh, swelling and foamy urine are a big indicator for kidney disease. But that didn't really you know, alarm me too much. I'm still going on with life, uh, just pushing through. And as women too, we often just overlook ourselves and keep going. So I was busy with my life. And one morning I woke up to take my daughter to her basketball game and I could not move at all. I couldn't even lift my head from the pillow and that scared everything out of me. And this is when I decided to seek medical care. So I got into my primary care physician and when I walked in, that really changed my whole life because I ended up being diagnosed as a hypertension patient because when they did my vitals, my blood pressure was 225 over 125. 
And I was immediately uh, seen as a person that wasn't, you know, managing blood pressure well. And I began a regimen to control my blood pressure. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. I went through about three different treatments and nothing was controlling it. And out of frustration, I started looking up symptoms and trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And remember, I have a background in biology, so I was a kind of a researcher anyway. And I had this book at home on women's health, and I just kind of strolled through it. And I found a very simple article about um, lupus. And as I backtracked my symptoms, as you can see in that first line, the first one that I really noticed was the joint pain. And I ended up asking to be tested for lupus because this was something that I knew was different and I had never had before in addition to the other ones. Lo and behold, it was lupus. And I actually was very happy, um, if that makes sense, to finally have a diagnosis because with lupus, it takes an average of six years to accurately diagnose the disease. Um, and I just felt like I was just gonna go on a regimen and get everything regulated. But as you could see, the next phase was I ended up having a six month hospital stay. My lupus was extremely aggressive. Um, I ended up having you know, seizures, I had a stroke, I developed a blood disorder, I had brain swelling, MRSA, collapsed lungs, and I lost my ability to walk because lupus had attacked my organ systems, primarily my um, central nervous system. But what I didn't know from that initial diagnosis that lupus had actually attacked my kidneys. There is a term called lupus nephritis, which is um, a specification that, you know, when people have lupus and it involves the kidneys or affects the kidneys, then you have issues and it brings you to the world of CKD. Um, for me, my lupus actually damaged my kidneys, requiring me to have to do hemodialysis. I did hemodialysis for nearly nine years, and this was a big wrench. Life had truly happened to me, and I didn't know, you know, despite all my education, all my planning, all of those plans had changed. And what I find in this community that that's often the case for us is you don't know what the future may hold, and it's often a big question mark. I was teaching and I had to walk away from that career and I didn't know if I was gonna be able to go back. But fortunately I did receive a kidney transplant in 2009 and I'm able you know, to return to life and I'm gonna share a little bit about this. Now, uh, you see this purple question mark under finding a path? Well, that's actually the logo for the Lupus Foundation of America and like Lori's organization were purple which is one of my all time favorite colors. And I just thought this was very fitting when we think about how do we get back up when we have kidney disease? You know, and I put some snapshots from my own life here uh, just to share with you all and encourage you today. I hope you find something helpful in this. And these are some tips that I did. The first thing is I learned to advocate. I was a person that did not feel comfortable speaking up to a doctor. I didn't want to offend anyone or make them feel like, you know, I was being bossy or pushy, but I had to learn to do that. And in, in addition, I had to get somebody on my team to help me advocate. And the who could I pick best was my mom. She's my ride or die even to this day. And she was my voice when I couldn't speak up, especially during that hospital stay. Next, it's really, really important. Um, as uncomfortable as it may seem, as frightening as it may seem, you have to work with your medical team. You need a good team. You got to put great people on your team. I can't say it enough. It's a team. And um, without that, it's going to be very difficult to navigate the world of chronic kidney disease or any major illness. And this is a picture of my team. This is actually my transplant team. And one little fun fact I'd like to share, this, this man right here, the third from the left, he was doing his residency, but what he didn't know is later, we, he was gonna be my nephrologist, what we didn't know, and he's my nephrologist today. He actually saw me um, post transplant and um, we're, we're writing this thing together now. And uh, the next thing you definitely have to have is hope. You know, as I sat in that chair, 
um, doing dialysis, I didn't know what my future was going to hold. And honestly, I didn't have too much hope. I will actually share that I did a lot of awareness in the lupus community, but I had a very, very difficult time actually talking about my life as a dialysis patient or my life as a person who really wanted to have a kidney transplant. That realm of my life was extremely frightening. And honestly, in the lupus community, there was not much material to help me with that. So I had to seek help with that and get over that fear. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later. You have to be involved. You have to be involved. You have to be involved. And this is actually a picture of me um, with um, Dr. Gabriel Danovich, who was on my transplant team. And you know, you have to be willing to open your mouth and be involved and be open about you know what you're concerned about, understanding what you're doing, um, any concerns you have. So you have to be willing to be involved in your care with your team. You have to be compliant. This is a picture of one week of medication. And I had to learn to put this tray together. I had to learn to um, take it on time because that's very, very important in taking care of this transplant. And I'm like a sergeant when it comes to this. But one of the biggest things, and this is one of my favorite pictures of us, Lori, is you have to have important relationships in your life. And I'm gonna tell you, and I'm gonna try not to cry, when I went to the first RSN um, conference, my first one, I went there and I actually sat on the front row in the corner by the wall. I wanted to know the information, but I didn't want to really be involved. And what really shocked me as I looked around the room, everybody was having fun. And I just could not believe it. I just could not believe people were laughing and making jokes and having this happy time. And here we were. Many of us needed an organ transplant, needed a kidney, or had serious challenges. And I thought, this woman is amazing. She's like this magical woman making everybody laugh. And I laughed so hard that first day. And from now on, from then on, we've been laughing. And so this was a relationship that has really changed my life and has added so much to my life. And I just want to say, you know, coming here today, and being involved with the Renal Support Network is something that really can change your life because you really need positive relationships in your life. And at the bottom, I've just given a snapshot of um, some things that I've done to find my path. Uh, and one of the things I did when I could not work, I needed to find something that gave me purpose, to give me a reason to get up every day, to give me a reason to feel like I had meaning. And one of the things I did was uh, get involved with RSN. My favorite, favorite uh, activity or event is the prom. And um, I'm sure you guys have seen pictures of it. And here I am with the team picking out dresses, living vicariously. Um, I had a great prom, but I mean, the RSN proms put my prom to shame. So I'm always excited to see what the theme is going to be. The other thing I got involved with was uh, One Legacy or the Donate Life community, because I learned um, as an African-American woman, the disparities of us and, and uh, that need kidney transplants is really, really big. And I was actually encouraged by a friend um, to get involved with this. I at first thought it was a little crazy to ask people about becoming an organ donor when I needed one. But I saw that this was important conversation to have because, um, you know, there's a lot of people on the list waiting and people need to understand the importance of signing up to become a donor. And that's one of the reasons why I'm able to sit here, because someone said yes and became a donor. But most importantly, um, I got involved with the Lupus Foundation of America as well, because I really needed to understand what I was up against and what this disease was that brought me to kidney failure. I had to face it and understand it. And whatever uh, reason you're here today, it's really important to be knowledgeable and to keep striving um, and, and really build your team, advocate for yourself, get involved, be compliant, surround yourself with great relationships and uh, really follow your passion to reinvent yourself as well. There's some things that you might 
and talents that you might have that you've never tapped into. And this was one of the things that I did along the way. So as I mentioned, I had the kidney transplant, but what I didn't realize is it brings a whole nother meaning or level of hope. Lori's tagline for this organization is, an illness is too demanding when you don't have hope. And that's the truth. But going through this whole journey with CKD has really allowed me to live my life with so much purpose and gratitude. And here I am, I did return back to the classroom for a short while. I went back and I'm teaching, I was teaching here in Koreatown, my last teaching assignment before I joined the Lupus Foundation of America. But when I returned as a teacher this time, I really invested so much more of myself in my work. I taught my kids about chronic kidney disease. I taught them about organ transplant and I taught them about lupus because you know, selfishly, I'm hoping that they would get involved in one of these aspects to help someone like me and you. Um, I got back into life. I took my first vacation, which I hadn't done in over 20 years and went out of the country because I was so afraid, you know, that I would be too sick or unable to take care of myself if I did that. I have been able to travel and spend more time with my family. And one of the biggest things is I was able to get back in life as a full present mother. Um, being tethered to a dialysis machine, it was really difficult to do that. And so the relationships and the things I do in life, I really truly value. And I just want to leave with you that there is hope on this journey. It may look very difficult. You might have that big purple question mark or question marks flying around, but I just want to come in today and let you know that there is hope for this. And most importantly, I just want to leave you, as we say in the organ donation community, life truly is a gift. I'm sitting here with the gift of over 13 years by a young woman who signed up, um, whose mother actually said yes. And uh, I hope that you value what I said today and find some hope in it because life truly is a precious gift. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I have some questions for you. Okay. So let's, um, let's, uh, at, so tell us a little bit about um, when you decided to go back to school, because I think it's so important that you really have furthered your education that has made you be able to work from home and do what you want to do, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you brought that up because I don't really talk about that much, but I think it's really important. I decided to go back to school because um, even though I went back to teaching, I noticed me after transplant, I had to work much harder to protect myself from germs. Um, I remember one year I got the flu and it scared me so bad. Um, and we're so immunocompromised when taking, you know, taking the transplant medication. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to change my career. I wanted to stay in the realm of helping people with chronic illnesses. And um, I decided to go into the field of public health. So I did it online, which I am a huge uh, supporter of this. You know, you can do your classes online. And, and this is what I did. I, I got help um, with my mom and family and I, I got a strict schedule and I went back to school online to change my career. So tell me a little bit about, because you, I, I learned you just have a new granddaughter. So now, Grandson. Can, can you believe that? I can't believe that, but I yes. mean, it just tells you the circle of life of how you've continued to thrive and now you get to be a grandma or you call yourself something else, right? I'm Gigi. <laughs> And how's your energy to keep up with Gigi? You know, I think the excitement, I never thought, you know, at first I was like, oh, grandmother, what a horrible term. That's like old lady term. But, you know, even the term grandma hasn't really bothered me because I just feel very honored and blessed to have uh, been able to survive and be able to experience this. It's, it's so much fun. And to kind of see a new life coming around that I can help influence and be a part of. Um, my energy is okay, uh, but I can see it's a lot of work. I'm glad I'm the grandmother, not the parent. Um, but it, it's been such a, a motivation and an inspiration for me to get up every day and enjoy 
I'm so fortunate we all live together so I can enjoy it every day. It's his name's James Amari. It's a little boy and I'm so happy. And I've always wanted my own son, but now I get to live vicariously through my daughter. Uh, another question I have is you've had your transplant for a while. How often do you follow up? So now I'm at the point where I follow up annually. I, uh, you know, as you know, when you're first transplanted, you uh, have to go really often for that. So now I'm at a year and I go in every year for a follow up. And with this whole COVID situation, how have you been protecting yourself? Man, I've been staying inside as much as I could. I have become the queen of order in. I love Instacart. I love Amazon. I love all of the online shopping. But, you know, I had to finally face my fears, Lori, and get out and about because I also like to get out and walk and everything. So I mask up. I follow all the CDC regulations, hand washing, all of that. And most importantly, I got vaccinated and I got the booster. So that's helped a lot. Well, and for the people who are listening, um, how did you pick the subjects or what advice could you give to people that are trying to further their education? Where should they start? Man, I like to tell people, when you think about if you were working before, a lot of times people are doing things that they didn't even like. You know, this is an opportunity to really go back to the drawing board and reevaluate yourself. Like I look at you, you love making jewelry, you love making art. And I think everybody should start with, what do you really like to do every day? And, um, you know, I can't say that I did not like my job before. I just didn't like the risk that it put me in post-transplant. And I knew that uh, I loved helping people. That's what I, I really, truly love to do. And I wanted to continue to do that, whether it was the lupus community or whatever community Whatever I did, I knew I needed to help people. And so that's where you should start. Look at your gifts and talents. I think people should also, you can do like interest inventories, personality inventories to give yourself an idea. If you're looking to do something new in life or do a different type of job, you can talk to a career counselor. But start this time with really thinking about what you love to do and figure out how you can make money doing it. I think that's the best place to start. That is so key. And I just want to reemphasize that, you know, if you have an opportunity to volunteer or use your skills, because you have to know how to use the computer. And if you mm -hmm. haven't been using the computer for a while, you need to really up your skill level. And there's so many free programs or to learn Word mm -hmm. or Excel or uh, any of those things. So, um, you know, technology is changing so quickly. I'm always looking for a teenager. I don't know about you, but can you show yeah. me how to do this? One thing I want to tell people too is um, going back to school doesn't have to be as daunting as you think. You can do little increments. Like I mentioned, the online world has opened up so much to us. Um, to be able to go to school. You can go to an elite school. I went to school in Washington, D.C. this last time around, and I was at home. And it just was a wonderful world. I met so many amazing people from around the world while, while I was doing the education. And um, you can also have modifications. If you really want to go back to school, there are programs and things out there and people to help you do that if you need modifications with your health. You can, you can definitely do it. And I wanted to also just give a shout out about there's a program called Ticket to Work that if people are looking for a job or want to get training, there are services available through that program. Um, I think different states have different um, programs, but check out Ticket to Work. It's by the Social Security Administration and there's resources to help you go back to school. Because the goal is, and, and you know this well, Wendy, when you have your transplant after three years of Medicare, uh, there, it, you're no longer qualified for the full Medicare benefit. There is some new legislation that's going to help pay for meds, but ultimately we need full health insurance when we're transplanted. So uh, going back to work helps make that happen. So that's true. Uh, be prepared. 
Well, thank you, Wendy, so much for participating today. And I'm going to attempt to be a Zoom producer here and remove your spotlight and bring up our next speaker, Dr. Mount. So thank you so much for your time. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> and a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.